Hello everybody and welcome to another spoiler review with the Border Prince. Today we're going to go over another classic from my box of crap. <laughs> Which brings up uh, gems. Right, so today we're going to talk about Pawns of Chaos. Uh, a very old book, um, literally 2001, so probably in the first... A dozen or so books without getting the list out I don't know but it was really early on it was one of the first and it's probably one of the most problematic books they've made and most likely that's the reason it could just be sales but the content of the book itself um, is probably why Black Library would rather we forget it exists uh, which is a shame because it's it is a really good book for the universe for the law. It's it's really entertaining. It's a nice, again, a unique story. But uh, some of the content might be a bit troubling. It's a fine line when you're doing a when you your when your business is a story of intergalactic war by uh, space fascists and religious fanatics murdering people and destroying worlds. It's a fine line between making that family friendly and going full on dark as fuck <laughs> the grim dark is a balancing act i have to say and they do it very well and that, this is probably one of the um there's a couple of other things like uh, malice dark blade is very dark very dark um again the novels get away with things that uh the you would not normally get away with and particularly the older novels before they they got such a hit with the horus heresy some of the books are a little bit more uh, spicy than <laughs> than you would expect, actually. The ones in Space Marines are generally not. They're, uh, well, then again, that old one, Space Marine, that was pretty harsh, really. It's just, uh, I suppose, you, you're getting you get inured to the uh, to the blood and the violence after a while with uh, Black Library stuff. But the older stuff is a lot harsher, and this is probably one of the harsher books uh, in terms of the stuff in it so yeah um we're going to talk about that <laughs> but i'm because um this is going to be on youtube and podcasted and if anyone doesn't know i do podcasts now so you can find me on all the normal places you would find podcasts and you can get audio versions of these so yeah i i am a bit concerned that i don't want to go too detailed i'm trying to you know Hold the line. Now, the reason it might be a bit fruity, um, a bit troublesome to the Black Library in, in current day to be publishing stuff like this is because it uh, is written by Brian, Brian Craig. Now, Brian Craig is the one who wrote the uh, Warhammer novels way back when, before Black Library existed. And he also drew... drew ugh, he also wrote a number of... Um, other ones, mostly fantasy, to be honest. I think this was his only 40k novel. And he doesn't appear to have... He wrote Zaragos as well. Which, again, is a bit um, harsher than some audiences would expect. It's the it's the little details that make you go, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, that's a bit much, isn't it? <laughs> where, other, where other authors would um, shy away from such detail i mean even aaron dembski bowden he goes borderline sometimes but um it's it's not as harsh there isn't the uh i don't know you know you get the tang in your nostrils and you're a bit like ooh. ooh. <laughs> i don't know how best to describe it i i can only recommend you try and pick it up um you can find copies on ebay um amazon has them on these reseller sites that come up now and again but, uh, yeah, it hasn't been reprinted since 2001, so if you can find a copy, it's probably one of the few that exists. Now, I'll read you the uh, the back, because you probably can't see that most places. Although it is actually available on Amazon. Ah, I'll put a link in there for you. <laughs> so you can use my link. I'll read you the bio at the back. Gavilon had already begun thinking of the bulk of his forces as gun fodder even though they had never faced guns before. The guns produced by the Imperium in their planetary-based factories were by no means as powerful as those that they had brought with them from the Star Worlds, but they were guns nonetheless, and there was nothing in Gulzakandra 
that could compete with them, except, of course, magic. If the Imperium was to be stopped, magic would be the force to do it. In the grim future of Warhammer 40,000, mankind is engaged in internal conflict with the armies of chaos. On the medieval world of Sigmatus, the hated Imperium is flexing its power with ruthless efficiency. The rebels have a plan to fight back, summon a powerful demon from the warp and unleash it upon their enemies. So, that is the premise, and it is an awesome premise, and the story itself, okay, we'll go over the story itself in rough form, I'm not going to go into the details of the individual characters, but Brian Craig's done a great job, this is a good novel, I think it's just that there's some troubling things in there, um, and I'll pick on two in particular, and there's other stuff in here as well, which... um, Again, sorry if you can hear me reading the book. I have got it in my hand once more while I record. Yeah. (laughs) There is... Okay. So the story starts off. Basically, this world, Sigmatus, is cut off from the warp. Now, it's a chaos. It was a chaos-held world. And for one reason or another, although this appears to be some cycle that keeps renewing itself over and over again for the sake of the chaos gods, but uh, the warp storm broke out and an Imperial fleet came to Sigmatus to purge it, with an Inquisitor on board the ships and Imperial forces, guardsmen, tech priests, all the stuff you would normally find on battleships. The warp storm closed around the world again, trapping the fleet, forcing the ships to land, or to crash land, on the surface. And the survivors of this crash landing use the ships, use the technology on the ships, to create an Imperium in miniature uh, to rebuild the society. And they conquered the local region, they took the population, purged them of heresy, and, well, you know, people have needs, and they began to breed with the local population. Now, it seems to be a sort of Again, this is why it's so troubling, I think, because uh, some people might take umbrage at this kind of stuff. But basically, it's um, the highest members of the society, the the elite, uh, are the those descended with the purest bloodline back to the original ship's crews and the guard forces and the various other groups that are formed. So there's there's a tech priest branch who can who are using the pass down knowledge from the tech priests aboard the ships to create weapons, to create vehicles, to create all the technology. So they they've got but they've got even less knowledge than the tech priests would normally have. Um, but they're sticking to what they've been taught by their grandparents and their great grandparents who multiplied basically. But yeah, you, the purer your bloodline is, the most likely you are to be an elite because that means you have inherited a position. So for instance, there is an inquisitor there. He's not an actual Inquisitor, he's a descendant of the original Inquisitor. Um, down the generations, it's become a hereditary role. And yeah, they've set up a society based upon the the military and civil institutions they had. They've plonked down on the planet and they've rebuilt their world that way, in the vision of the Imperium. But by subjugating the local population and breeding with them to produce a new sort of race, I suppose you'd say, or people um it's not so much about the race it's more about the fact that these these cultist tribes have been purged of the worst of the heresy but um the closer you are to being related to them rather than the imperial forces the lower down the social hierarchy you are if you understand right so immediately that's a bad thing to be putting in books in the current era (laughs) Um, because people will take it the wrong way but it makes perfect sense in the book I mean it does make perfect sense and in terms of the universe it makes perfect sense again right so you've got this society and it's based on the shattered remnants of what survived the landing the ships themselves are they form the capital they're within the capital city they've got ground cars they've got factories they've got all this stuff they're producing shittier versions of what the Imperium's got so automatic rifles you know machine guns fairly basic technology uh, based on you know what they can produce there from the tech priests that were present and what they managed to bring with their ingenuity to support this new society that was on the planet now their role had been to destroy the enemy on the world so they began to just do that again to fight the local tribes to conquer the planet 
And that's what they've been doing for several hundred years. And yeah, the society has grown since then from this original thing. So the captain, the governor, the generals, all that stuff. Now, by this point, they've only got one uh, functioning plane and it's kept as a sort of, it's hard, they don't understand the technology again because like the West of the Imperium, they don't really learn how something works. They just learn what to do to make it work, if you understand what I'm saying. So there's there's lots of nice elements like this. It's 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 the microcosm of the Imperium. But the uh, the problem comes, I think, for Mr. Brian Craig in this book, where uh, and and its chances of getting reprinted when he describes how they are uh, taking care of the cultists and their children. <laughs> and also the worst one, the worst one is um, the uh, they have a prison within the capital city where they uh, keep those women, preferably attractive women, who have been accused of witchcraft and whatnot by one person or another. They put them there, ready for execution the next day, so that certain, the nobles or the elites, whatever you want to call them, can come along and have some fun the night before. So, yeah, you know, there's stuff like that in it, um, which is which is pretty harsh to read and I don't think would rub quite well with the modern with Black Library's current uh, (laughs) literary output so yeah the story is basically this Uh, the Imperium is expanding into sort of the the last it's conquered all the tribes all the heretic kingdoms you know all the chaos worshipping kingdoms you get a nice vision of what these tribes believe in terms of how they view chaos that it isn't necessarily an evil. It's just a religion. It's, it's you know, they sacrifice to God. The God rewards them. And, um, yeah, yeah. They uh, basically are being destroyed by the Imperium and they are on the retreat. Now, it's kind of a last stand of this last free people led by a chaos sorcerer who's proper corrupted. But, again, he's sort of like a folk hero to these people because the the enemy is the Imperium. These people who come and murder their families <laughs> and other stuff. But they're pushing forward now. This is the last resistance on the world. And once these people are destroyed, they will have conquered the planet in the Emperor's name, as their ancestors were supposed to. Basically, um, they decide to raise a demon called Satharal, who is a Lord of Change, who has not appeared anywhere else. Without going into too much detail, because I do recommend you read the book, and I don't want to make it pointless to read but this is the basic rundown they managed to raise this demon and he because he's a lord of change he's not he does one good thing does one bad thing he he lifts the warp storm and the weak blooded descendants of the fleets of the imperial fleets psychers who still exist but they are they're nowhere near as powerful as they were they managed to get a really weak psychic signal out asking for aid you know sending out the message that's been sent down passed down to them to send out when the moment comes and the imperial fleet picks it up and they come to investigate uh, the warp storm has been listed the, there's this world here they probably have records of it and so on they come in and they are trapped because the warp storm closes around them again now they have no idea what's going on. They know that this is a chaos held world. And they see that it's got cities and manufacturers and stuff like this. So they bomb the fuck out of the Imperiums on the Imperial forces on the ground, uh, these descendants, and then end up landing again, uh, sort of in a cycle. Yeah, that's basically what happens. There's loads of awesome stuff in it. There's political intrigue, obviously, because the Inquisition on the planet is a kind of power base against the governor and the uh, the other military forces there, and they're all hereditary roles and stuff. It's, um, you know, people, like the governor's plans for the future, how he wants to break apart the ships that have been kept as relics, and he's going to do this by getting rid of the Inquisitors, there's no one to oppose him, once the victory's been won and all that. Yeah, it's just nice little tidbits about imperial society and its relationship to those who follow chaos, and how chaos tribes work, how your regular chaos worshipper would work one that isn't a fanatical zealot with a you know i don't know their skin spilled off their face and running at the enemy these are just normal people farmers you know so yeah the as i say the 
The troubling thing is, I mean, the, the fact that this stuff is in there, it does create an awesome, um, it shows that the characters, there is no good character. <laughs> there is no wholly bad character, which is always the best, which are always the best characters. There's, you know, it shows, because everybody's capable of doing great evil, given the right circumstances, and everybody's capable of doing great good, given the right circumstances. And this is the situation on Sigmatus, on this world. But I really like it. I like it. I like the vision that's created this story, and it is a fantastic tale, and I definitely recommend picking it up. I'll put a link in there. It looks like you can get it for, like, a pound. <laughs> so, you know, I think you're paying a pound and then postage, so you can definitely pick it up. I don't think there's a digital copy anywhere, though, because this is long before they were doing that sort of thing. And again, I don't think they're going to release it unless there was a massive uh, call for people to get it. But, um, yeah, I, I definitely recommend it. It's a great read. It's one of them ones that stuck with me over the years when I read it. It's probably like the fourth or fifth book I ever read. So, yeah, it didn't do me any harm reading this stuff when I was a child. I've turned out really, really well balanced, I'm, I'm sure. I'm, pr- I'm pretty sure. So, yeah, Horns of Chaos by Brian Craig. A definite must for any real fan of the lore and the history. Because nothing he says in there I don't think is wrong. Um, in law wise it's all it completely lines up, you know, it's it's internally consistent, it's it's fine. It's just he's gone a bit harsh. But then I've read his other one. Um I've read well, I've read most of them, I think, of the old Warhammer novels. Um and I also read Wine of Dreams, which I'll probably do a review of again because that's another favourite of mine. A really old novel there. I think that came out after this one. Or before. It was either this one or Wine of Dreams. Oh no, it would be the Zaragos, Zaragos ones. They were the last things he did with them. So I'd have to say, I mean, I don't even know if he's alive. I'll have to look it up. Yeah, so stay tuned for Wine of Dreams and definitely go and pick this up and follow the links below for other stuff. But yeah, it's a good book. It's a really good book, but it's uh, it's not family friendly. <laughs> it's, it's a grown up book. <laughs> Okay, thanks very much for watching and I will see you next time. Cheers.